Hi to you Baptist. My name is Miriam, if we haven't met, and it's a pleasure to be sharing with you today. I'll be sharing on Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 22, and thanks David for reading that. Now in this chapter, Paul firmly challenges several elements of the audience's old identities, replacing them with a new identity in Christ, and I'll be exploring two of those identities. But first I wanted to share some of my own story, which I think mirrors the Ephesians story a bit as well. See, I'm the child of cross-cultural workers, and I grew up moving around a lot, mostly in the Middle East. And there are lots of pros and cons to this style of growing up, but one of the interesting impacts was on my sense of identity. Now, because kids who grow up away from their passport country uh, often look different to locals where their parents work, and because they may look similar but feel very different to the peers in their so-called passport countries, they can develop a bit of an outsider complex, and this can actually produce quite a bit of ego. Certainly for me, I prided myself on being the outsider, on being different, perhaps even being better than my peers who had seen different parts of the world or had different life experiences. And it may have been a survival mechanism, but it bred a rather unlovely arrogance in my identity and attitude. It was only through the patience and grace of my friends and my peers and a little counselling and some work with my mentor that I learned to disconnect myself from that identity. And the experience of the Ephesians has some parallels so as Amy shared, Ephesus was an important port city in West Asia, and the Ephesians played host to maybe half a dozen significant temples, most famously to Artemis, whose followers nearly killed Paul in a riot, as we read in Acts 19. So while definitely a key part of several empires, the city was famously independent and proud, once even refusing aid from Alexander the Great, when their temple to Artemis collapsed in an earthquake, they rebuilt and paid for it entirely themselves. So the citizens of the city saw themselves as special, as blessed with wealth, independent, as outsiders perhaps, from the rest of the empire. They were a city of religious high achievers, used to earning their gods' goodwill through their wealth, their crafted idols, their acts of devotion, and their daily sacrifices. Now, as you may remember, Paul spent over two years in Ephesus, preaching to the Jews in the synagogue, and later debating with the Gentiles daily in their meeting places. And God did miracles through him, and the news of Jesus spread all through the province of Asia. Everything was going pretty well, until a guy called Demetrius, a silversmith and idol maker, began to see his sales declining. So Demetrius incited a riot, claiming that their goddess Artemis was under threat, and the Ephesians spent two hours chanting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians, baying for blood. Paul was hustled away from the area, and he later left the city. So several years later, Paul is writing from prison to encourage and update churches on his situation. And as Mark highlighted in his sermon a fortnight ago, no specific event or sin prompted the letter. Ephesians was likely a circular letter written to a bunch of churches in Asia, with Ephesians just one of its audiences. And although there are no specific greetings to those in Ephesus, we do know that a lot of the challenges that Paul wrote about were those being experienced by Christians in Ephesus, and so we can trust that they were definitely in his mind as he wrote. Chapter 1, as Amy and Mark explained in their sermons, is all about thanksgiving and encouragement and a summary of what God has done, what the gospel is and how incredible its blessings are, and how it is offered to us even before we could accept it. This good news, summarised in chapter 1 verse 10, is God's plan to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. So keep an eye out for that language of unity, because it matters later. And chapter 1 ends with a prayer that the readers would experience the power of Christ, power that is available to his people. Chapter 2, however, switches gear. Paul takes time to reiterate why this largely Gentile audience needed that good news. And you, he says, were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Paul is making the point that those not in Christ are not just in a neutral state, just chilling before they objectively make a decision one way or another. To not choose Christ is to choose something else. They are actively being guided and worked in by the prince of the power of the air, that is Satan. But this browbeating is not just for the Gentiles in the audience. This good news is needed by everyone. We all once lived, says Paul, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. Children living in wrath, children destined for wrath. And this sentence is intentionally left hanging. It's grammatically challenging and it leaves the reader on a cliffhanger. How will my sin be dealt with? Paul really loved his rhetorical tools, though it makes for complex reading. 
but then he brings the grace. But God, he says, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And in this passage, Paul is intentionally challenging another key element of the Ephesians' old identity. That is, the idea that they have rightfully earned their God's approval. They even perhaps own their God. In the context of Ephesian household gods carved and shaped out of silver and placed in little alcoves in the home, Paul challenges their temptation to think of Jesus as their own. Jesus is not yours. He's not ours. We are his. We are in his story. So to the city of religious high achievers and stilled idol makers, he speaks of God's work, God's grace, his handiwork, even their salvation so that no one can boast they are created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. He picks up their craftsman language on that, and expands on that line. We kind of throw away line earlier, by grace you have been saved. And he explores it more. And this is not by your own doing, he says, but the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one can boast. For we are his own workmanship, created in God with good works that Christ has prepared for us beforehand. The Ephesians no longer identify, can identify as the expert craftsmen or the wealthy trade city or the land of many gods. Their works do not set them apart. Their gifts are not their identity. Their creations are not their identity. No, in Christ, they were given a gift by God, which is not the result of good works, but which is the leads us into good works. He is the ultimate craftsman, the ultimate silversmith, the ultimate gift giver. I wonder what shiny, empty objects do we bring to God or others attempting to earn love? Is it our money, our success, our dress size, the laughs we get, our stage time in church, how many acts of service we do, the number of minutes in our quiet times? What do we want to identify ourselves with? So here the Ephesians and ourselves are challenged to unclench our fingers from around those things we try to find our identity in uncurling one finger at a time and handing them to God. Leave them alone, they get us nowhere, and leave us lonely and dead in our sins. But Paul isn't done with strong words to the Ephesians. Next, in verses 11 to 23, Paul challenges their outsider identity and pushes back on their pride at their separateness, their arrogance towards the Jews. Remember, he says, that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Paul pushes them to look to a completely new identity. The Ephesian church did not earn their place in the faith nor their place in the community. They are no longer outsiders, no longer the special, different ones, no longer to be identified with Artemis, no, no longer separate from the Jews, no longer craftsmen who made their living off of others' beliefs, off of daily statues of Artemis. They are no longer, as Paul says, the uncircumcision, that is, the Gentiles. They are no longer separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. They no longer have no hope. They no longer are divided. We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. So when I began to realise that my identity of outsider was an unhelpful defence mechanism, it was with mixed feelings. It certainly it was and is wonderful to realise that you can belong somewhere, that you can be part of a community. And yet there was a safety to my outsiderness. I could be other, and then perhaps I could be better too. And I could judge without investment. I could guard my heart against hurt by not being vulnerable. I could be cool and different and someone people talked about. And to give that up was good, but it also felt like a sacrifice. To be Australian, I had to be willing to wear Australia's history, its sins and its joys. And I have to be willing to lay down my ego to be part of the family of Christ. And perhaps it wasn't so different for the Ephesian church, coming into unity with the Jewish Christians. To be Gentile Christians, it might be tempting to claim a greater insight. The Jews had God's word for so long, they just didn't get it for ages, and then we got it, and we became Christians right away. But Paul shuts that down. They were distant from God in their separateness. Now they have been welcomed into family. The right response is nothing other than thanksgiving and humility. Humility. 
Their identity is now to be in unity with others in the body of Christ, particularly the Jewish Christians in that city. He has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, reconciling us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing all hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far off, and peace to those who are near. To the Pharisees and the sinners, the Samaritans and the disciples, the older son and the younger, to those who've worked in his field for generations and those who've just been welcomed into the workforce, he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. Now, I see this sometimes in the church today, too. As the expression of church changes and shifts across millennia, it can be tempting to see our own church as the better church, the more discerning church, perhaps. The church that really gets what Jesus was on about. Perhaps even the cutting edge or the future of what church will look like, and I've heard that language used. We can be cynical about different churches or older churches or more traditional churches or perhaps more progressive churches, but it is not given to us to call other those whom Christ has called friend. I'll say that again. It is not given to us to call other those whom Christ has called friend. And where Christ is central, we are family. So then, as Paul says, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Of course, this brings with it all the joys and pains of family. Families fight, families disagree, families misunderstand and hurt each other. And sometimes, as in the case of, of unrepentant abuse or violence, people lose the right to be called family. But where Christ is central... We are family. And together we're called to be, as Paul says in verses 19, members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into the holy temple in the Lord, in him you are also being built into a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. And I love that this passage ends with language of the temple, a dwelling place for God. This picks up some parallels with the Old Testament passage in 2 Samuel 7. And in that passage, David comes to the apparently sudden realisation that he has reached a pinnacle of wealth, and yet God still lives in a tent. I wonder if he thought, I've gone so far that God has been left behind. And yet God puts him in his place. Have I ever demanded a temple in all my years of walking with the people of Israel? He reminds David of who really has the glory in their relationship. I plucked you from obscurity and made you king. And perhaps we sometimes think that we can bless God with our glory, or like the Ephesians, make an idol to fit him in. God shows us quickly how ridiculous and unnecessary that grandstanding is. It's such a pointless flex. But he goes on to promise David even more. He doesn't want a temple from David. He wants wholehearted devotion. He wants to bless his people. So when Paul speaks to the Ephesians of being part of God's temple, he is again challenging their ego. You think you'll build me a temple like you rebuilt the temple for your so-called goddess? No, you will be part of my temple. Join together, says Paul, with others who we used to be separate from. Perhaps others we used to, we might prefer to be separate from. I wonder who in your physical and church families and communities have you been proud to be separate from? What cynicism about family or community do we need to repent of? We have a new identity and a new family in Christ. I'll finish, of course, with a poem. This one is called Curtain, and it goes like this. Bearing down the length of history like a freaking freight train. The feet first dive of God towards humanity. The divine barreling through time and space, headed straight for us. He is pounding towards a curtain. Building speed, he sprints towards a wall, more impenetrable than the iron curtain, more heartbreaking than the Berlin Wall, more separating than death itself. And the angels are beginning to cringe now, and the demons are starting to laugh as the inevitable collision approaches of the divine with the unbreakable dark, and the angels curl their wings over their eyes as the moment of truth arrives. Just before the catastrophic impact happens, there is a shocking glimpse of a spark. Two hands have reached through from the human side, two hands with massive nail scars, gripping the two sides of the impenetrable curtain and ripping it apart.
The divine bursts through the barrier, flings through the broken wall, an open door where once there was darkness, a walkway once and for all. But now, with good, even the best of intentions and all that old maxim implies, our shaking hands and busily trying to stitch the curtain shut again. How do we respond to the new identity that God offers? Are we willing to accept it? Thank you.